Welcome to worship this morning. Happy spring. You people don't sound very happy that it's spring. Happy spring. I would do a cartwheel, but I would hurt myself, so we're not going to do that. Uh, Welcome Scott Bailey today, our organist. Uh, Give him a good welcome, and uh, I'm delighted that he's here to fill in and to provide music and aid in our worship this morning. Rhonda Courtright, who normally would take blood pressures uh, today, the the third Sunday, uh, is out of town. So there are no, uh, well, I mean, we all have blood pressure, but she's not taking any of the the blood pressures uh, today. Sermon talk time following the worship this morning in our usual place. So you can grab a cup of coffee and and refreshments and, and join us for sermon talk time. We are preparing to reopen the nursery. And by the way, thank you for those who worked this week to... uh, The nursery had become kind of a Christmas storeroom. And uh, Bruce came in, and I know it was at least Bruce and some others who came in and and removed all that stuff. Uh, Another group came in. uh, They uh, cleaned and sanitized the nursery. We're all set to go. And as we approach Easter with uh, visitors and so on coming in, we need to be sure that we can have that available. And so there is a nursery sign-up sheet. Uh, Should be on the uh, refreshment table there. Uh, We need two people to be ready to man the nursery every Sunday. We have several Sundays, so two people. There is an orientation video, a training, uh, that you will be a part of, uh, Safe Child Training. And you can be a part of it. We need two people to be ready to go on Sunday. Now, if you sign up and we don't have any kids there, then, you know, you get a free Sunday vacation time. But um, uh, we need to be able to do that. A collection for victims of the Kentucky tornado in conjunction with Matthew 25 Ministries. Paper towels, feminine, feminine hygiene products, toilet paper, diapers, baby wipes. And those can be uh, dropped off uh, This coming Sunday, March 26th, from 10 to 12, or if that doesn't work for you, there is a uh, container out front where you can drop off your offerings, uh, supplies there. Uh, Through the month of, uh, please keep Jean in your prayers. Um, Her 93-year-old mom, there are some decisions and some health things they need to deal with. Her mom is up in Toledo. They have family. Um, So... Uh, if you could remember Jean and her mom in prayers, she's here Mondays and physically present here Mondays and Tuesdays, and then working remotely, still accessible through email, and you can uh, get in touch with her that way. She responds. Uh, she's working remotely because she's up with her mom uh, as they make decisions about uh, where she is going to be uh, living uh, through this month. And so by April, we should be back on a regular present schedule for her. Of course, I'm here Monday, uh, well, today I'm here, but uh, Sunday through Thursdays, uh, I'm always available, and for emergencies as well, so uh, all the time. So uh, please remember her in your prayers. If you have any other questions about that, let me know. Uh, We are continuing to collect peanut butter and jelly for for His Glory's food pantry. No glass jars, please. Um... I think last week I said that you can only get grape jelly in plastic jars, and I was immediately proved wrong. Uh, You can get a variety of jellies, especially if you have the squirt kind or stuff like that. So uh, it's an opportunity for us to help. That's the uh, for this month, peanut butter and jelly. The sun is shining. It's the first day of spring. It reminds us of God's goodness and grace that fills our lives every moment of our lives. And for that reason... Let us prepare our hearts to worship God. Let us join together with a call to worship. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. For steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. For his steadfast love endures forever.
please join me in the prayer of corporate confession. Holy Father, we confess that we may approach you with our mouths and our lips when our hearts are not in worship. We confess that we offer to you that which costs us little. Though you are a great king, we often bring to you the leftovers of our time, energy, gifts, and worship. We have neglected your commands when it is inconvenient for us to keep them. We have ignored your laws when it causes us to lose our ease. We have disregarded our neighbor's needs and wondered aloud why other people do not meet our needs. O oh, Father, have mercy on us. Forgive us of our many debts. Cleanse us and give us the mind and heart of Jesus, who came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. In his name and for his sake we come to you. Amen. And now a silent moment for personal confession. This is the good news. God pardons and absolves all who truly repent and believe his holy gospel. Our scripture reading is Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, from the New Revised Standard Version. Hear God's word as I share it with you. Therefore, you have no excuse, whoever you are, when you judge others. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, are doing the very same things. You say... We know that God's judgment on those who do such things is in accordance with truth. Do you imagine, whoever you are, that when you judge those who do such things and yet do them yourself, you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Do you not realize that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But by your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. For he will repay according to each one's deeds, to those who by patiently doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life, while for those who are self-seeking and who obey not the truth but wickedness, There will be wrath and fury. There will be anguish and distress for everyone who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My name is Marcus. Your pastor asked if I would share an experience with you. I am a member of the church that had received this letter from Paul. And I'd heard about Paul. I'd heard about his dramatic conversion and his work. In fact, some people in our congregations knew Paul personally, had worked with him on some missionary trips. And and 
uh, I was eager to read and hear read in our congregation gatherings what Paul had written to us. Now, as let me tell you a little bit about the makeup of the congregation in Rome of which I was a part. It's very different from this congregation. The first main and big difference was that you have a church building, and our congregation in Rome had no such church buildings. In fact, we were scattered throughout the city in home groups, what you would call home groups. Various congregations meeting in people's homes on a regular basis, spread like salt throughout the city of Rome the center of the Roman Empire. And our makeup was quite a bit different. Now, I understand that um, the makeup of this congregation tends to be pretty homogeneous. That is, you're all very similar in background and uh, very similar in uh, stages of life and, and values. And that was not so with the congregation's that I was a part of and am a part of in the city of Rome. We had very different people who were part of our congregations. For example, I myself am a Gentile Christian. I grew up in Rome. I uh, lived a good Roman life, that is, until I heard the gospel. More about that in a moment. Many people in our congregations and the home church in which I was a part and attending were well off. They, could, they spoke Greek, they were able to do uh, business and, and did well. Others were not so uh, well off. And some of our people were even slaves who attended and needed, uh, lived very difficult lives. And we would help them in whatever way we could. And so many of us came out of those, that uh, Roman, pagan background. Idolatry, everything that Paul mentioned in the first part of his letter was absolutely true. That was how I used to live. And I had walked away from that had been a part of this congregation for a while, and as Paul was writing in the first section of that letter about uh, God's wrath against the pagan Romans, I was cheering him on because, well, after all, I was living a good life. And he mentioned this righteousness from God that is through faith. Well, there were some people he was writing about in that first section who clearly needed that. But remember, I said our congregation is a mix of people, not just socioeconomically and backgrounds, but there was also a large segment of our congregation that were Jewish Christians. Now, I understand, I've been told, your pastor said to me that that uh, that's an unusual statement, an unusual concept for you to understand. How could someone be a Jewish Christian? Uh, people who came out of the Jewish background, they uh, came out with that uh, living the Torah, some still observed uh, the Sabbath and other holy days, according to the first five books of the Old Testament, living that Torah. And the question was, it was for us was, could a Gentile, like myself, could a Gentile be a Christian and still be a Gentile? And that question would be talked about from time to time. And some of the congregations had that mix of, of Gentile believers, Jewish believers, uh, Jewish Christians, Gentile Christians, in their gatherings, rubbing elbows with each other. And so we thought, many of us thought, out of that background, that we were living pretty good, decent lives. Yes, I'd, I'd come out of a Gentile background. I had once lived as a Roman, but I'd walked away from that life. I walked away from idolatry and the other false religions and that manner of life. And I was living a pretty decent, good Christian life, so I thought. 
And of course, the, uh, the Jewish Christians as part of our congregation came into our congregation from that background, the background of the Torah, of living God's uh, life, living kosher, kosher not just in food, but also in everyday life, by how they dressed, by how they conducted themselves. And so they also thought that they were pretty good, decent people, and on the outside they were. And so together, the, the, our two groups were cheering Paul on in that first section. Yes, of course, those pagans, those Romans, needed the grace of God. They needed this righteousness from God. Clearly, I mean, look at how they're living. On the other hand, us Christians, we were living pretty good, decent Christian lives. And so we were in less need, obviously, of of this righteousness from God. That was for other people, not us. I was cheering Paul on as I heard this letter being read in our assembly. But then he said something that got my attention. In fact, it was something that, well, it, at first it made me very defensive. Because obviously I thought I was leading a good, decent life. God would be pleased with how I lived. I didn't need this righteousness from God because I was achieving it on my own. And then it was though, as this letter was being read, as though Paul, through this letter, was looking directly at me. You, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. And I certainly was doing that. For at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now, I got defensive when I heard that. Paul, I don't do the same things. I don't live as those people who clearly need this righteousness from God. I don't conduct myself that way. And on the outside, my life could look very... Uh, good. Uh, it could be an example for others to follow, so I thought. But then as I thought about that portion of the letter and began to contemplate it, I realized that outwardly, on the surface of my life, I may not be living as those pagan Romans, but inside. That's a different story. Now, I may not pick up a sword like a pagan and commit murder, but I might murder someone with gossip. I might murder someone by refusing to forgive them, by holding on a grudge as I had. And so when I realized that, I understood that I was just as guilty as those other Romans whom I thought needed the grace of God, and this righteousness from God. And I understood I, I could not achieve this righteousness on my own. And Paul continued. There was something else that he wrote that hammered that home for me and left me without excuse. Further on down, and by the way, this letter, what is throwing me off a little bit as I read this letter is that you have these numbers in here, chapters, and I guess those are verses. That's not the letter that we received. We didn't have those numbers in our text. I understand that those were added later so that people, well, people like you, <laughs> could find things easier in the Bible as it was all put together. And so reading down further into his letter, the nail got deeper into my heart. Or do you show contempt for the riches of God's kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance? Everything stopped for me at that point. The first section, and now I was hearing this read. Showing contempt, thinking little of God's kindness in my life. Thinking that I didn't 
need as much of God's kindness and grace as those other people who clearly needed it. Because my life was better, and yet it was not. After all, some of the phrases I'd use is, yes, but I'm forgiven. You know, those, those pagan Romans and how they lived, they are certainly under God's judgment. But yeah, I may do the same things from time to time, but I'm forgiven. My life is better. And in that process, the only way that my life is better is because of God's kindness and mercy and patience with me, driven by his love and grace. And I dare not presume upon God's grace and take it for granted. And that was the final nail in my heart. And I realized that I was in just as much need of this righteousness from God, desperately needing it, as the worst of my pagan friends there in the city of Rome. I was no better. I could not achieve my own righteousness. So as I, as I talk to you about my experience there in the city of Rome, I wonder, I wonder what you think. I mean, I imagine, for example, that you are good church people. You attend worship. You volunteer for committees. I have no idea what committees are. Someone's going to have to explain that to me. You volunteer for work around the church. You certainly don't live as other people live. And you might consider yourself good, decent people. But like me, do you realize how the desperate need in your life for God's righteousness? Because like me, I could not achieve it on my own. Only as a gift of God, through faith alone. So your pastor talked to me a little bit, and the reason, one of the reasons he wanted me to, to share my story with you today was because he said, we're talking about the bad news first. And that's the end of the bad news. How does it work? How does this righteousness from God as a gift through faith, why does it pardon us in God's sight? Why is it necessary? How do we make it real? How does God make it real in our lives? Well, your pastor said he's going to cover more of the good news starting next week. But he wanted me to share with you my experience and realization that though I was leading a good, decent life, you might say a good, decent Christian church life, I was in as desperate need for this righteousness from God as anyone else in the world. And I dare not presume upon God's grace. So what is the good news? How does it work in our lives? Your pastor will be back next week with the rest of the story. But for now, thank you for letting me visit with you. Um, I'm glad that I was able to be here. Oh, and your pastor also said for me to tell you, God is good. Amen.
confess our faith through the uh, brief statement of faith we have in our bulletins or on the screens this morning. Let us declare what we believe. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick, binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinful life, raising the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. Amen. Be seated. As we come to our time of uh, prayer this morning, uh, it was shared in the prayer requests uh, this week. Judy had uh, emergency surgery. Uh, She is, I talked to her yesterday um, on the phone, and she is likely to go home today recovering. Now, she has a little bit of a road of recovery and a few days of recovery. But um, we were praying for her all week, and prayer changes things. And so she's able to be home. So please continue to pray for uh, Judy and Jim Holt uh, as she continues the recovery. Also, prayers for continued prayers for the mission study team as they continue uh, their uh, hard and good work. Prayers for peace in Ukraine. And what are some other requests that we might share together? For Richard, okay. Yeah, we'll be happy to pray for Richard. Let us go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you hear all prayer, spoken and unspoken, and and we dare not doubt that you hear our prayers and um, you answer them. We pray for open eyes, open ears, open heart to see you at work. As we have seen you at work in, in Judy and Jim's life, we pray for continued recovery. We ask that you would continue to use the talents of her physicians, nurses, all who care for her, that uh, she would grow strong. And through them, 
you would return her health and strength to her, fill Judy and Jim with a strong sense of your presence and grace. We thank you for those who are serving and working so hard on the mission study team and pray for your continued insight and wisdom and progress that they are making. We pray for peace in Ukraine. And as we hear news reports, may we not forget that you are still sovereign and that governments are not in control, but you are. And so we pray with, uh, with those who are in Ukraine for your peace to fill that region. We pray for the Sullivan family, especially for Emmy and Evie. We pray that you would Uh, Use also the talents of everyone who's caring for them, nurses, doctors, technicians, that through them your healing grace may flood into their lives. We pray for a strong sense of your presence as well. We pray for Richard. We pray that uh, you would remind him how special he is to you. May your love and grace fill his life. We pray for Beth as she recovers from a double lung transplant. We pray for your healing grace and strength and patience and perseverance to fill her life. Not only her life, but the life of those who care for her, her family, her loved ones. May they all have a a sense of your presence and caring grace. We pray for Laura that you would bring her home safely today and uh, bring her home to us and family. And we pray for uh, those things, those concerns, those worries, those joys that we have not shared publicly. And we ask that you would hear us now as we lift up those silent requests in silence to you. Lord God, we thank you that you hear all prayer, spoken and unspoken. And there are times in our lives, due to joy or due to great stress, that our prayers sometimes don't even have words, and yet you hear them. And we are thankful. And hear us as your people. We pray the prayer that your Son and our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we move into the prayer of dedication, again, thank you for your dedication. And remember, and you hear me say this every Sunday, Uh, I hope it doesn't become routine because it is not. That you are not supporting an organization, you are supporting the kingdom of God. Especially at this time of transition within our congregation. Uh, God is doing good things through you to advance his kingdom into the good future that he has for this congregation. And so with that, please join me in the prayer of dedication. For the wondrous gift of life. We are thankful, O God. Your generous outpouring of grace reminds us of the fruitful life we are called to bear. And may these gifts of time and labor therefore embody our desire to share and contribute to your coming reign among us. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 